40 years ago, the movie The Exorcist was first released in 1973. And it raised that question about demon possession and the casting out or exorcism of a demon-possessed person. And since that day, the interest in the topic of demon possession and exorcism has come and gone. And as much as we may have enjoyed the, the movie and it's been a classic, there really haven't been any forms of demon possession in the extreme as portrayed in that movie. Not that I know of in any way. But the question that is raised is important. Is there such a thing as demon possession? And to answer that question, our gospel lesson today would say an emphatic yes. In the encounter that Jesus has with the demon-possessed man, we see Jesus exercising, casting out the demon, and making whole again the man who was hurting. And we see again what life in Jesus and his mission and his ministry is all about. Now, during my pastoral ministry, I can't really say that I've had many encounters with demon-possessed people. As a matter of fact, I don't think I've had any. But there was one occasion ten years ago where something happened so dramatic and so drastic with a woman in my congregation that I did begin to wonder whether or not there was a demon possession or an evil spirit at place. There was this woman, faithful member of the congregation, healthy, younger woman, couldn't have been much older than 40. She was a mother of four children ages 6 to 17. She was a healthy flight, uh, flight attendant or stewardess. She was married to a New York City police officer. She would be out running just about every day. I'd see her running around town or running in front of the church. Then one day, all of a sudden, out of the blue, without any warning, something snapped in her. She had been online on the internet looking at a spiritual site when all of a sudden she began to have these visions about some sort of conspiracy involving the owner of the New England Patriots football team. She then felt as though God was talking to her personally, telling her to do certain things, some of which got her in trouble with the law. She ended up having to be hospitalized and then heavily medicated. You can imagine how scary this was for her husband and for her four young children. For me as a pastor, I felt helpless, unable to give her any sort of pastoral care. And to this day, this woman who was so perfectly normal before all that, continues to struggle and need medication just to function and to deal with this each day. Now, whether or not this was really the possession of a demon or an evil spirit, or it was some sort of underlying mental illness that had snapped because of a mental breakdown, for our purposes, I don't think it matters. Because as we live in this sin-filled world, we are constantly struggling with evils, with sins, with demons, real or intended, that seek to tear us away from that which is good, that seek to tear us apart and take what is whole and healthy and destroy it. And whatever the evil, whatever the demon may be, the solution is still the same. Finding the love and the grace of God in Christ Jesus so that he can heal what is broken and make us whole again. Now, even though we may debate and discuss whether or not demon possession happens or it's real in our world today, there can be no doubt that what we heard in the gospel lesson from St. Luke was indeed a demon possession where Jesus did an exorcism. As much as we may want to try to explain it away with many other things, as you look at the facts of the text as they're presented to us, the incredible transformation of that man who was possessed by the demons, the reaction of the witnesses, the crowd, and then their fear of Jesus after he did it, there can be no doubt that what we heard as recorded is what happened. And it makes sense. Because it's another example that St. Luke puts before us of helping us, as the hearer of the text, understand who Jesus is and why he came into the world and why he comes into our lives. There's so much in the healing of the demon-possessed man that gives us insight into our faith and our walk with the Lord. All the other people around Jesus in the Gospel of St. Luke are constantly asking the question, who is this Jesus? It's ironic that the demon, the demons in the man, immediately recognize who Jesus is, and they're afraid of him and his authority. 
then they don't even have the power and the ability to disobey him. Showing us again the power of Jesus' word in our lives. When he cast out those demons and told them to leave the man, they had no choice but to do it. And we see in the miracle in casting the demons into the pigs and the pigs drowning themselves, the hierarchy and the value that God places upon us as human beings in his creation. As much as we may love our animals, they're still here to serve us and help us as human beings. And in the loss, the death of the pigs as they drown themselves in the lake, we see the power of sacrifice in the face of sin and death. And this miracle, like every other miracle that we hear about in Scripture from Jesus, foreshadows the ultimate power and authority that he would show forth to the world in the events of Good Friday and Easter morning. See, it was the power of his sacrifice, his taking the evils, the demons of the world upon his shoulders upon the cross, that cast out, exercised the sin, the demons, the evils of this world, and makes wholeness again. And this also helps us to answer the question and understand why maybe we don't see as many of those demon-possessed people as we hear about in Scripture. Since the time of Jesus' victory by his cross and empty tomb, demons and sin is in its death throes. It's but a last breath. It's been taken care of by Christ's victory and by Christ's resurrection. And that's ultimately what the message of our faith is always about. Finding the healing, finding the peace, finding what we need in the midst of the things in the world that seek to tear us apart and seek to destroy us. I can't say for sure what's demon possession and what isn't demon possession, but what I can tell you is that God tells us over and over again in sacred scripture, there are powers and principalities that we can't understand and we can't see and that they're very real in the world. And since they're out there and they're real, there certainly can be spirits, demons, and other things that enter into this sin-filled world seeking to tear us apart and destroy us. But whatever it may be, whether it's real demons or it's just the demons we deal with each day, things that we struggle with, our vices, our sins, and other problems, the solution is still the same. God comes to us through the gifts of Christ's death and resurrection, God comes to us with his love and his forgiveness to cast out, to exercise that which is evil and seeks to destroy us. God's desire through his gifts to the church, his word and his sacraments is to bring us healing and to make us healthy once again. David Letterman, the host of The Late Show, for years struggled with depression. Yet he didn't want to take medication for it because he was so afraid that it would change his, his personality and make it difficult for him to do his job and entertain people. Until in 2003, when he had a bout with shingles, he finally gave in and started to take the medication. And after a few years of this, he had a sit-down interview with Oprah, and he talked about this, and he talked about the difference the medication can make. He said that it's, it's so wonderful now I feel like I see life with 2020 vision. We are blessed with so many miracles of modern technology and things of the world that help to cast out some of the ills, some of the evils, some of the things we struggle with. But for those things that can't be fixed by the things of this world, Jesus comes to us to exercise, to cast out what seeks to destroy us. That's what the church is all. That's why we gather here. It's really about Jesus filling us and casting out the ills, the evils, and the demons, whatever they may be. As a matter of fact, for years and years through the history of the church, when people were baptized, the liturgy of baptism included what was called a little exorcism. Right up to the 1800s in the Lutheran church, there would be this portion of the liturgy where the pastor would hold his hands over the baptized person, the soon-to-be-baptized person, and breathe on the person and say, cast thou out evil spirit and make room for the Holy Spirit of God. And it was seen as an exorcism that the ills are leaving, and through baptism in the <coughs> waters of God's grace, God's Holy Spirit is filling the gap, it's filling, filling the void. That's what happens here. Every time as we gather as God's people, His presence and His spirit 
casts out what seeks to destroy us. The great 20th century theologian C.S. Lewis, who gave us the Chronicles of Narnia, talked about this being the main and only purpose of the church. He said the church exists for nothing else but to draw men into Christ and make them little Christs. If they are not doing that, all cathedrals, clergies, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself are a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose than to draw men into Christ. As Christ is drawn into us by the gifts of the church, there's no room left for the ills, the evils, the demons of our world and our life. And as we're filled by Christ's presence in word and sacrament, those demons, whatever they may be, are cast out. And, and we're like that demon-possessed man in the gospel lesson. That which stinks, that which is like filthy pigs, sin and death and evil and things that seek to destroy us are drowned by the waters of baptism. And what rises up out of the waters is like that new life that the demon-possessed man had. Wholeness, <clears throat> health, and then the power to tell others about the love and the healing of Christ. Amen. Amen.